question? Are you done? Yeah. I was just saying, just ask the name and, name and rank again, just at the beginning, just as a little bit of introduction, just who are you and... Oh, okay. Uh, right. Who are you? Who am I? Yeah. That's a good question. Right. I'm, I'm 93 years old. I'm an old man. <laughs> That's number one. Oh, well, uh, my name is Tom, S-A-T-O-R, Sator. I'm, I'm a Hungarian, I'm Jewish, and uh, I graduated from the university, uh, Golden Gate University, majored in accounting, and I, I practiced accounting for almost 40, 40 years. I had my own practice, and I must say I was fairly successful, I can't complain. And then I retired when I was, I think, 68 or 69, and have been retired ever since. And since then, I did a tremendous amount of nothing. So um, under what circumstances did you join the army? Were you drafted? Did you volunteer? No, no, I, but I had to register at the draft board. But I wasn't a citizen. And. Uh, in 1941, uh, when the Japanese invaded uh, Pearl Harbor, the Germans and the Hungarians declared war on the United States. So I immediately became not only an illegal resident, but also an enemy illegal resident. And I tried to join the army because the immigration department wanted to deport me. But there was a very kindly immigration agent and he kept postponing my file. Finally, he said, I don't know how long I can keep this up. Why don't you join the army? I said, I, I tried, but they said, they, they have no jurisdiction over me because I'm an, an, an illegal enemy resident. But he finally knew somebody at the Presidio, and I went up and there was a captain. He said, will you, will you be willing to renounce your Hungarian citizenship? So I asked him, where do I sign? He said, OK, come back tomorrow. He said, here's the Bible. Will you swear allegiance to the United States? I did that. He said, OK, you want to join the army? I said, yes, sign here. I was in. That was in April 1943. So you didn't join with any friends? The which? You had no friends when you joined. It was just you on your own. Just on my own, yes, sir. Okay, so you joined the Army, you went to basic training and tank school. Where? Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, what was tank school like? Well, t I tell you the truth, tank school was, was a little different because mostly they taught me geometry and how to maintain an engine. And they showed us uh, where the tracks were on a tank and where the turret was, where the gun was, but beyond that, very little. That's pretty well it. That was tank school. I mean, you they, 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 didn't, they didn't show me how to drive one. They, they didn't show me how to load a gun or, or how to do gunnery. It, it was basically mechanical. Where did you learn to do the driving and gunnery then? I learned to drive. I, I had a license when I was still in high school in, in San Francisco. I learned to drive a car. France, and they put you on a ship well, and said, here you go. You know, in Fort Knox, you know, when we joined first, the first time the guy, a sergeant came out, who knows how to drive? So nobody told me any difference, so I naturally I volunteered, which was a stupid thing. And then he said, okay, you, you, and you, you know how to drive. You see those trucks over there, they're all muddy and dirty. Go wash them. <laughs> the Army has not changed. Well, uh, I basically learned how to do drive when I, when I was transferred into the company. Did you have any choice? Did, did you choose I wanted to be in tanks, or did they just say you were going to be tanks? No, no, I had no choice at all. No choice at all. They assigned you. The only choice you had is when, when you, I got inducted at the uh, Presidio of Monterey, and then they asked you, do you want to go in the Army, the Navy, or the Air Force? So why Army? I, I really don't know. I just 
I, the army I knew I could probably wind up in Europe, which is where I wanted to go. I wanted to go back to Europe. And I figured if I get lucky and survive the war, I could go back to hu Budapest, Hungary, which was my original goal. Was there a job that you wanted? Did you, did you want any particular job? No. no. You didn't care? No, no, no. So what duties did you have in the tank? What positions were you? Oh, well, I, I was basically a loader. I was a loader, basically. Yeah, that was my, and, but I did some bow gunning and some driving. And the reason they, they ask you, so, you, you know how to drive? So yeah, I know how to drive. Do you think you can drive a tank? I said, well, I could try. So uh, I think it was Sergeant Morphew one, one night. He says, well, sit in, I'll show you the con controls. And it wasn't that difficult. I learned very quickly, and then they made me drive around a little bit on a meadow. And shifting was, came natural. So I said, OK, you're a driver. And where was this? Was this at Fort Knox or in France? No, no, that was already in France. No, in Fort Knox, they didn't, never, never taught me how to drive. OK. Um, where did you see service? Well, we went, I went to England first. Well, after basic, they transferred me to the 16th Armored Division. And then they sent me to England in a maintenance outfit. And from England, I stayed in England until about, uh, I think, October 44. So I missed, I missed the invasion completely, thank God. But after the Battle of Aircourt, the division lost an awful lot, so they needed replacements, and I was a replacement. So from England, they sent me to uh, France, and from Fontainebleau, south of Paris, was a rep repo depot. So you were going to the 4th Armored Division. So they shipped me to the 4th Armored Division at Chateau Salin, which was in November sometime. And, and then on, I got into Company B, and I stayed with them until the war was over. What famous signposts have you, have, did you go by? What, what cities did you see? Oh, well, we went uh, well, from Chateau Salin. We went to, uh, we stayed in a little Alsatian town, Mittersheim. And from Mittersheim, we went into the Battle of uh, Walsheim and Gersheim. It was early in December, and then it was singling which according to uh, Jimmy, uh, uh, Leach, my company commander, was on the 6th, 6th of December. He always said it was the 6th of December, so he must be right. And after singling, we, we pulled back to Mittersheim. We were supposed to go into reserve. And then on the 22nd of December, he said, mount up, fuel up, MO up, get five days of rations, move out. So we went up north to, to uh, Arlon, Bastogne, and uh, joined the Battle of the Bulge. So after, after Bastogne, we went back to Luxembourg to refit. And from Luxembourg, we. In, in late February, we went to, to the uh, Rhine, to, the, to Eifel, Bitburg, and Andernach, and to Bad Kreuznach, Oppenheim, to the Rhine, ran across Germany to Chemnitz, when we met the Russians the first time, and then we went down to Bayreuth and to Czechoslovakia, met the Russians the second time. And then the war ended on 7th of May. You, you have this map. In brain, you know, imprinted in your brain. Yes. Naming all these little towns. Oh yeah. Well, you know, the, some of those. Uh, you don't hear much about uh, Walsheim. Walsheim was a little, a dirty little Alsatian town. It had a blue building, which was the brewery. And uh, I didn't see any infantry around us, 
But on the, on the basement of the brewery, there was an aid station that was full of wounded GIs. And that was not a pleasant place. But uh, we, I, a tank was, was located behind a, 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 a small house, which had a, a courtyard. And the courtyard had a cow in it. And this cow was wounded by an artillery shell. And it took him ab about two nights to die. So we sat there taking artillery for three, four or five days and listened to that poor cow dying. Nobody had the guts to get out and shoot him. So I, I never forget that poor cow. What was your first impression of the Sherman tank? Well, I thought it was, uh, oh, Jesus. You know, I never get a phone. It can, it, I can go for days, <laughs> never <laughs> get a phone call. Without, without a call. Huh? <laughs> well, when you f first see a, a big tank like that, you're really, I mean, you're, it's formidable. And, and, and it's big, and you try to get in, and they teach you how to get on it. And you learn very quickly, because when, you, when, when the chips are down, you got to get in and get out very quickly. It, 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 the, the Sherman was a very impressive piece of equipment, believe me. Did, did, you, did you feel powerful and invulnerable in, in the tank? Or? Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, there's no feeling like it. You sit in the turret and it starts rolling to a village and you're sitting up there and you're looking it down to everybody and you feel like you're, man, you're, you're a conquer, conqueror. Uh, that, the trouble comes in when somebody starts shooting at you, and then the whole thing changes very quickly. Yes, you're but of course when you're you... describing my experience so perfectly. It's <laughs> I mean, I, it hasn't changed in 70 years. Um, okay, so you, you said you worked for Abrams. What was Abrams like to work for? Well, you know, I was very lucky because I first met him in Mittersheim. Abrams had a habit of coming down to see every company personally, especially before an action. He'd come down and talk to the guys and tell us what we're going to do and why. The first time in Mittersheim, we trooped around him and, and he says, well, we have, a, we have a new arrival and tomorrow we're going on a small road march and we're going to so, show the gentleman how we earn our living. And this small road march pro turned out to be singling. And singling was a, a real brutal battle. But anyway, uh, he was, I liked him because he's very good to me. He did things for me. He, he helped me get back to Budapest. And, and uh, I found, I, I admired him. He was very brave bravest man I ever met. He always sat on top of his tank, the turret, with his legs dangling down, and a mic in his hand, directing everybody where to go, what to do. And he always, uh, never, uh, as far as I know, he never got wounded. But my God, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have done what he did in, for $10 million. I thought, I still think, I was extremely lucky that I, I, have, I, I met a man like that. He, he was a great, he truly was a great man, as an individual. Was the, uh, was the tank your home or just a piece of equipment to you? Your, your tank, what was your relationship with your tank? Did, did, was it like your home or was it just a piece of equipment? I was very fond of my tank because it protected me from small arms fire, from artillery, and I was much happier inside than out, I'll be honest with you. Did, did you personalize it? Did you have little photographs? We had, we had well, we had several names, uh, B Company, so every, everything had to be started with B. You know, A Company, th their names started with A, and C Company with C, B Company. We had all kinds of names. Uh, I was going to put on it, uh, Bound for Budapest, but the guys wouldn't let me put it on there. So I, I think we had one tank uh, called uh, uh, Battling 
bad student, excuse the expression. And then uh, there were various names, you know. So your tank was traveling about? No, 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 no. There was one tank was the guys painted it on there. So what, what did you paint? I don't know what we had. I don't know if anymore. I can't even remember what name my. I don't think our our guys were too. Nobody was really worried about it. Yes. Um, did you did you have any little creature comforts inside the tank to make it a little bit more livable? Oh yes, the creature comforts were great many. He had a hard seat, a metal sides, which is either too hot to touch, and it was very, if you bump your head in it, you get knocked out or your elbow. So, you know, we had, we had a stewardess serving, uh, you know, hot meals, and, and uh, we had an extremely good head and a shower, naturally. Uh, there was no creature comfort inside the tank. It wasn't designed for creature, <laughs> creature comfort. How did you make your coffee? Make your pardon? How did you make your coffee? Oh, well, at first, uh, you know, the, each tank was equipped with a coma stove, it, which was, you know, high, and when you, when you lit it, 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 it took off in a big flame, which, which was, you know, so I don't know, I think it was in the Elsa someplace, I think in Mittersheim, we ran across a, a tank, and the tank had a German field stove. And this was a wonderful, it was flat, and it was easy to light, and burned with a blue flame. It was a beautiful piece of equipment, so I stole it. And we had that, I had that, Everybody wanted it, of course, but I, I had it and I sat on it. And for instance, New Year's Eve, I, I fired it up and started making coffee. And it warmed up the tank. It was a really nice piece of equipment. I wish I could have kept it. The, the, the German tank was already dead when you, sat, when you saw it? No, it, was, it, it actually was. I think it was in, in, in Walsheim when I got this, out of the Mark IV. There was a Mark IV sitting in the middle of the, it was intact. And the side of the turret door was open. And the radio was working. So Leach told me, find out what they're talking about. It, they're talking Bavarian accent. Who, who could understand? I mean, you know, it's impossible. So. I listened to it for a while. I couldn't understand what the hell they were talking about. So I, cli I was curious. I climbed in, and there was this stove. So I said, Jesus, that looks pretty good, better than the Coleman. So I lifted it, and, and I kept it. Thank God. That was a, that was a wonderful piece of equipment. Uh, that was in, in, in Walsheim. That's how I got the stove, yeah. Did you, uh, did you receive winter? Clothing uh, for the for the winter of forty four. Uh, did you receive winter clothing? Thick coats. No, no, no. We 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 had a regular, you know, uh, M one jacket and the fatigues, and and the GI boots, which were not waterproof. I guarantee you, and uh, it was cold. I had an overcoat, of course, and and a mitt, and a pair of gloves. And, and I think uh, everybody had their uh, GI blanket. But uh, we'd not, we, we received winter clothing, beautiful, ah, marvelous winter clothing. If, when we left Bel uh, Luxembourg in late February, and then we got complete pants and jackets and waterproof gloves, ah. But by that time, the, the winter was over. It started to get warm, so. <laughs> so. Did you uh, did you have any traditions or superstitions in the tank? Superstition. Well, there was an old GI superstition: never light, never light three people on a match. You know, uh, that was. You never never cross, shake hands crosswise. That's the, the standard. You you never light light three three guys on a match. 
Huh? I didn't hear that one. No, that was, the, 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 you know, because we're all smoked. Everybody smoked. But you never, you never light three guys on a match. Two is maximum. Yeah, so, so that's like we can't have apricots. You're not allowed to have an apricot on a tank today. Apricot? Apricot. No apricots on tanks. Why? Because they're bad luck. You're kidding. No, no, this started with the Marines in ah. 1944. And I, I guess somebody figured out that all the, all the Sherman tanks that were destroyed had apricots. And they probably had other things as well, but they focused on the apricots. Oh. And ever since then, apricots have been bad luck. I guarantee you, I never saw an apricot in my tank. <laughs> no, no. The only thing I saw is K rations. No apricots. No, 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 no. What was your impression of other allied countries, the British, the Russians, the French? Well, the, the British, I thought the British were very brave. And uh, actually, in England, when we were in England, they treated us very, very well. I, I had, you know, I admired the British because I used to go to London when the V1s and the V2s were coming down. And, and I found the British very nice. They were polite and considerate. And it, at least they treated me, the guys I buddied with, were always treated very, very well. Uh, and I, I thought the British were great. I still think so, because uh, I'm an Anglophile. I, I, England was a very, is a very nice place. I like the English. The French, I don't know. Everybody, but you couldn't, you know, I remember Captain Leach. If you said anything about the French, he would fight you. He always told me, told us, uh, look, the French were very good to, to us especially the Maquis. They helped us a lot. So he, he had no problem with the French whatsoever. I didn't have that much to do with them because we went to France very quickly. So Alsace was a terrible place because in those days, you know, the, the villages were mud, mud huts. There was no pavement, no, no plumbing, no pavement outhouses, thatched roofs, mud up to your rear end, cold, miserable. Alsace was not a, not a happy place. The Germans, hey, you know, it took me, it took me a while to get used to the Germans. Actually, the Germans can be very, very nice. But for the first six months, you were pretty resentful. The mere fact that you had to be there was their fault. And being Jewish, you know, I had my resentments. But I stayed in Germany from 45 to uh, 1948, because I signed up. And I got to, got to know a lot of Germans. And I have to tell you that uh, the first impressions were, were not exactly correct. The Germans can be very nice. They can be very nice. Uh, right now, I know, uh, I know uh, a German soldier who lives in uh, Salinas. And he was in Bastogne at the same time that I was. And he and I became very close friends. So people are people. You get to know them individually, and uh, they're nice. Did you, did you have any interactions with prisoners? Rus Russian, no, we, we met the Russians twice. And uh, there was one incident in, in, uh, in Bavaria, a town called Plattling, which is about uh, half an hour on the Danube, south of uh, Degendorf. And Plattling was a POW camp, and this was in 1945, maybe July, August, or September, middle of, of after the war ended. And they had Russian prisoners of war. That means uh, Russian soldiers kept captured by the Germans. And then we took them over. And they, we left them in that in that it was in the field. 
and there's very little facilities for them. But I guess the army tried to feed them and, and provide medical care. Uh, they were in a bad way. And then one day the Russians came by and said, we need to, we, there's an agreement, those people have to come back to Russia. And you have to help us get, get them on trucks so we can take them to Russia. But these people did not want to go back to Russia. No way. They, they did. So this, that's one of the places where the, uh, uh, where the uh, chaffee came into. We had a bunch of chaffees. And we surrounded the, the camp. And all the GIs, all the fellows said, what are we doing? We're going to we're going to help the Russians return these guys. They don't want, we know they didn't want to go. And somebody cut the fence, and these guys started to escape. And I had a, an officer with us, and all of a sudden he disappeared. So he said, we, the Russian, Russians said, well, you've got to round them up, help us round them up. Well, we didn't. Everybody... First one tank left and the other. So all, all the tanks, they had about half a dozen tanks, and we all took off. So I, I hope that most of those guys escaped. And uh, the other time you met the Russians in Czechoslovakia? Czechoslovakia, yeah. Yeah. That was something. When the war, you know, it was on 7th of May, and they all come at us. Tovarish, Amerikansky, ah, oh, I love you. And they had vodka. And we had cigarettes, and we all got drunk, and they were dancing and singing. Uh, it, it was incredible. We were all alive. Hey, we were all alive. The war was over. You how, know. How, how did you discover the war was over? How did you find out? Well, we, it was, I think, the afternoon of the 7th of May. And we were sitting in a tank in, 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 Czech, in a small town called Horazdovice. And all of a sudden, our stations to one, our stations to one announcement or something like that. And believe it or not, Churchill's voice came over the uh, radio announcing that, that uh, the Germans signed the surrender agreement, that the ceasefire and the war is over in Europe. And this is the tank radio? Sir? This is on the tank radio? Yes. On your combat radio? Yes, okay. yes, yes. So what was your first thought? Thank God, I'm alive. <laughs> of course, Let, let's have a drink. Let's have a drink. Um, I was, you know, everybody got out of that tank, the, the infantry jumped up, uh, and everybody started firing in, in the air. When, uh, when the Japanese surrendered in, 19, in August, uh, was there any was it, was it an event? Well, we were, we, were, we were stationed in a small German town called Neumark in Bavaria. And they told us, well, 4th Armored Division, you guys got a lot of experience. You, you'll be the first to go to Japan. We're gonna, you're going to pack up, and we're going to ship you, you get, go down to Italy, you're going to put you on, an, on a ship and send you to Japan. You'll be part of the Jap you, invasion of Japan. So we were really sweating it out. I don't think anybody in my outfit wanted to go. Ah, oh, Jesus, not again. And then, I can't remember exactly, but I remember this. It was in the morning, somebody started hollering. You know what happened? You know what happened? They, they dropped an atomic bomb on Japan. It just spread. What are you talking about? Said, we dropped an at uh, what kind of bomb? An atomic. What the hell is an atomic bomb? Nobody knew. Said, it's a bomb that destroys the whole city. So we looked at each other and said, well, you know, we were, we were used to ha seeing carpet bombing and fire bombing by a thousand bomber raid. What the hell is the difference? Where, where, where you burn up in a thousand bomber raid or whether you get you know, blown to hell in, a, in an atomic explosion. But in any case, 
if the Japanese surrender, that was wonderful, then we don't have to go. So everybody was hilariously happy. Yeah. Did the, when, when did the whole points thing start happening? The points to go home, when did, when did that start? Jeez, I don't know exactly. All I know, there was all of a sudden talk about it. How many points you got, Seder? I don't know. What is the point system? And they started explaining if you have, if you had a metal, a silver star, or a bronze star, or a purple heart, you get so many points extra. If you have so long over, if you were in so many engagements, they had a point system. I don't know. The army army dreamt up some kind of a point system based upon your individual service. And if you had so many points, you were eligible to be sent back to the, to, to the United States. Apparently, I had quite a few points because uh, around, uh, I think it was around September or October, he said, well, if you want to go home, say that you go home, you're, you're, you're slated to go home. He said, I don't want to go home. I want to go to Budapest. Colonel Abrams promised me he would get me to Budapest. Well, you, you go. You gotta go home. I said, "Well, how can I stay?" Well, if you if you if you re up, if you sign up for another hitch, you can stay, which I did. And then they transferred me transferred me out of the line outfit into the counterintelligence corps, and made a special agent out of me. And I I didn't have the foggiest notion. So while you speak German, you'll make a good special agent. Counterintelligence. What did I know about intelligence? Absolutely nothing. And they never trained me. They never, never sent me to school. They sent me out in a small village and they said, you're, you're, you're the second. There's the agent in charge, and there's only two of you in there, and you're the second in command. The command of what? <laughs> there's only two guys in this village. You know. And what am I supposed to do? He says, well, the guy will tell you what to do. You started off then as a, a somewhat illegal Hungarian immigrant. You Not somewhat illegal, absolutely illegal. I, I was a certified illegal enemy alien, yes. All right, so you started off as an enemy alien, and then you went from being a tank loader to being a counterintelligence officer to being a constabulary soldier. That is quite a journey. Can, can, I mean, if you told somebody that today, they almost wouldn't believe you. Well, it, that's true, nevertheless. That's, yeah. It's, it's one of those, it's one no, of those not, not only, Not only that, you wouldn't believe it. I met a German lady, girl, and she and, she and I fell in love, love at first sight. And I married her. And I was married to her for 67 years. And my, my mother disowned me. She, she said, that, no way. She, she wouldn't talk to her for three years. But then she got to know her, and, and eventually she, she learned to love her. So uh, after about six, seven years of marriage, she, every time my mother talked to me, she said, you don't count. Your wife said this, that's the way it is. But you say it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it's one of the things that I, I, I presume the same. I'm so happy from the experiences that the army gave me that yeah. I never want to do them again. I, I listen. I wouldn't do it over if you paid me ten million. But I wouldn't give it up. I, I, I would. I, no matter. I, I would change it for nothing. Just, it was the most wonderful thing that I, I ever happened to me. And the army, and I, I must tell you, the army was very good to me. On the whole, they, they treated me well. They fed me, they clothed me. And, uh, and I, I, after the war in, Euro, in Europe, it was, it was a ball. I had a good duty, I had a good time, and I was a big shot. When did you become a citizen? Uh, I became a citizen while I was in the 16th Armored Division in, in Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. I had a first sergeant 
who was a, an Italian bookie in Brooklyn. And when I got into the outfit, one day he called me to the uh, orderly room, and he looked at me. He said, I'm not going to have a foreigner in my army. Tomorrow morning at ODs, 6 o'clock, you, you're here in, in, in the orderly room. So I was there 6 o'clock, and he was there in uniforms. It was, it's quite a, this guy was, he had tailor-made uniforms, diamond, diamond rings, diamond watches, hundred, one of hundred dollar bills, a real Damon Runyon character. And he says, get in. So the command car was there with, with the captain and, and the exec. Nobody said a word, he said, get in. And they take off. And I'm sitting there, I said, where are we going? Nobody says a word. Ah, oh, Jesus. I think I'm dead. They said, they're going to take me and shoot me. They went to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and they drive up in front of the courthouse. They said, get out. I said, now it's over. I know, walking up to the courthouse, going to a courtroom, nobody says a word, sit down. So by this time, you know, I'm shaking like a leaf. Here comes the judge and the chief of police and the sheriff and I think the mayor. And he says, Private Sater, approach the bench. Man, I'm going to be taken out and shot for sure. He looks at me. He says, Private Sater, are you ready to, t ready to take your American citizenship? And he made a speech. He gave me my citizenship papers. And as soon as everybody congratulated, oh, man, it was wonderful. He, and his first sergeant came, he put the citizenship paper out of my hand. He said, that, that goes into your file. If you get a discharge other than honorable, he said, you'll never see that again. The only time you'll get that back is when you get an honorable discharge. And then he gave me a $100 bill. He says, go get lost. Get drunk, do whatever you want. Tomorrow morning, you, you better be at the, uh, at the company. Yeah. Did you ever see that paper again? Sir? Did you of see course. That paper again? Yeah. When I got discharged, I have it. Of course I did. Yes. In hindsight, did, uh, did your opinion of the Sherman tank change? Did you think it was, do you still think it was a great tank or? I still think it was a great, of course it was a great tank. Listen, what was wrong with it? It was a, the, the 75 gun was too small. There's no doubt about it. The gun sight was inadequate because it was, it was a, a Navy gun sight. And when you compare to what the Germans had, uh, you realize the German gun sight was, was extremely superior. It was a beautiful thing. It, it had range finder, and, and when, you, when you turned the scope and, and got the target into the, into the dot, you can turn the scope upside, and, and the hairline went up and down, and you could read the distance in meters down here. You put the same number on, on the elevation, and you hit, hit the trigger, first shot was a bullseye. It was beautiful. That was, that was better, but they didn't have an automatic breach, and they didn't have a power turret, and they didn't have a st hydraulic stabilizer, and their automotive was not good. Sherman was a very reliable. We, we had one tank in the outfit that they said came all the way from Normandy to Czechoslovakia. Can you beat such a thing? So to me, Look, we didn't know any better, let me put it to it this way. But the fact was that you were inside and you were protected from artillery and small arms fire. And that was a big thing. It was a very big thing. So, and the German was fast. The engine, the, the Ford engine was beautiful. The Germans, uh, you know, they, they had the Panther with that high velocity gun. The best thing they had was their bow gun. 
when they solved the problem of, of uh, citing the Balgan, whereas uh, the Balganer in the Sherman had a periscope, and that was it. So you had to elevate up and down and watch the tracers. So if you didn't, didn't hold it high enough, the, the tracers would go way up, or if you go too high, the tracers would go down. It took a while to, to learn how to shoot straight. No, the Germans had a had a an, a headpiece. You put your head in there, and there was a there was a sighting hole parallel to the barrel, so you could see through it, and you you knew exactly where the hell to shoot. How about the seventy-six millimeter Sherman? Did you get any? Oh, the seventy-six was a much better gun, but they still didn't have. They still had the old gun sight, the old Navy gun sight with a, with. A, horizontal lines, and the tank commander had to tell the gunner 600 yards. So he went up and down, said, well, you're 50 over, F fire two, so you're 25 under. You need three shots, two if you were a real good gunner. By this time, if the Germans took a bead on you with that high velocity, 75, they hit you. That that uh, the, the, pan, the Panthers, even the Mark IVs, 75 had a high velocity barrel, and it would go through a Sherman from one side and go go out the other at over 1,500 yards. So that could have been could have been a better gun. There's no doubt about it. But hey. Uh, to me, the Sherman was a good tank. It was fast, it moved fast, it was reliable, and uh, hey, it protected us. In your opinion, do you know this job? He had to know because when you when you needed uh, ammunition, and and the tank commander says, "Well, I need AP or HE," you can't go mucking about. Where the hell is it at? You know, you gotta have it. Boom, now. So what I used to, I used to know exactly where, where I stored the ammo and what I, where I stored what. Well, was that the same in every tank? So if you got into another tank, it was stowed the same way? I, I think most of them were similar. They are similar, yeah. But what I used to do is when we went into action, usually the tank commander said, well, we're gonna need that. I didn't hear any tanks, persuaders. Persuaders were code name for t enemy tanks, so they weren't reported. So you're gonna, you're not gonna need AP. So I used to put one shell in in the breech, and probably two in my lap, and two or three on the floor, just, just, just on the floor. And when it came to shoot, he'd say, "Okay, target." Sh I mean. We didn't have, I understand nowadays you have a bunch of code words, but we never had anything like that. Uh, the tank commander would shoot a gunner target or Joe, target. Can you see it? it, it it's a machine gun or something. He said, okay, I see it. What's the distance? Oh, 600 yards. Okay, fire one. So by this time, I, I had a shell in the breech, and, it, and I, I'd kick him with my with my right foot. And he and I had the signal, you know, he knew when I kicked him that the gun was ready to fire. So he hit the solenoid with the left foot, the gun fired, the shell comes out, and by this time, I had the second one in there and kicked him. So we, we could fire, I would say, three, four seconds. Within three, four seconds, every three, four seconds, we fire a shot. And the same thing with the AP. If there was a tank, I'd have at least two or three APs in my lap, just holding it and then kicking him and he, he fire and kick him, fire. It used to go very fast. 
I moved very fast. Let me tell you something. When you have another tank coming and you see him, and you see his gun coming out, you move very fast. Did, did you feel that you were in a disadvantage compared to the German tanks? No, no. You don't feel disadvantage. You, you don't know any. I mean, you know, it, it, you hardly think. I mean, you just, you're too scared <laughs> to think. You just do. You just do automatically because you figure if you don't do it, you're dead. Um, okay, different question. In your opinion, do you think that the younger generation of today properly appreciates and honors the history? I don't think that you know people who weren't there can appreciate. I mean, this is a difficult question. How can how can somebody appreciate something that they don't know anything about? The younger generation grew up in peacetime. Even though you had Vietnam, I know, and Korea, and, and, and Iraq. But by and large, they grew up in peacetime. And uh, you know, they, they're spoiled. They had everything, beautiful homes, beautiful cars, lots of food. So they don't really know uh, what wartime really looks like. So when you ask me, do they appreciate, how can they appreciate something that they don't know any, anything about? Wartime was a totally different proposition. And when my generation went through the Depression, which was very difficult, people were broke, didn't have money, and they, they were good to each other. We, we didn't have drugs, of course. And, and if, so, you know, you ask me, the kids nowadays are, they're spoiled, and we spoil them. And why shouldn't we spoil them? We're, we're a rich, beautiful country. And, you know, life is precious, so let them enjoy it. For my, I'm, I'm a cons of course, my generation, we're more conservative. And we look, look at life different than they do. So if they, if they can't appreciate something because they do, if they can't appreciate something because they haven't experienced it, what is, the, what is the real benefit to our recording stories like yours or our keeping tanks in museums? What, what is the benefit to them? Well, I can imagine it's only historical. After all, you know, we, we go back to the First World War, we go back to the uh, Civil War, we go back to the Revolutionary War, the Thirty Year War. Uh, the, we go back as far as the Punic Wars, Hannibal, Alexander the Great, all, all the wars down history. And there's con continuous research, which theoretically we should learn something, but we don't, and that's too bad. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes it's necessary to go to war. I realize that, but uh, if you can avoid it, it's better. It's better to avoid it, no matter what. But there is times when you have no choice. message to the younger generation who are watching this, because you know, most of our viewers will be younger, what would be your message to the younger generation? It's, how can you give a message to them? I, I would say just, just be honest, be, work hard for what you earn, and study and learn. That's the most important thing, to study, to learn history, understand how things work, and be nice to your fellow men, basically. I know it's hard to do because sometimes your fellow man is not nice to you. So then you have to respond. And uh, only, only Christ turned the other cheek. Nobody else does. And it, it's, it's not 
necessarily true that turning the other cheek is a good thing. Because the people who try to hurt you are not going to listen to that. They're going to hurt you, so you're going to have to fight back. There's nothing harder in the world than to do that. But if you don't do it, you're going to be a slave. We're going to, we're going to kind of go back a little bit. Uh, was, singling the longest, was singling the longest engagement that you were in, or was there a longer battle? No, no, Bastogne was, Bastogne was longer. Singling was only one day. So for Bastogne, when you were told on the 22nd we're going north and you were basically fighting for a week? Well, we, we, were, we were there from, I think, Christmas Eve, of course. Christmas Eve, 24, 25, New Year's Eve, and then for about a week after that. Middle of, middle of January, they pulled us out. So that, that went on every day. Did, uh, did an enemy tank ever shoot at you? Or was it, did an enemy tank ever shoot at you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bigonville. Bigonville was there. We, we knocked out. It was a, actually, it was a Sherman the, the, with German markings. It belonged to the 9th Armored Division. And the Germans kept, must have captured it, and they used it against us. They put a German marking on it, and that thing came over the hill and knocked down a tree. We all saw it at once. And, and Joe, Joe put in five shots in the turret. <laughs> and I, I loaded five shots in there. Sergeant Grady's tank was to my left. And after the section was over, he, ca he came over. He said, I thought you guys were shooting the 50. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. I, I've never, I never moved so fast in my life. But, but Joe, Joe put five shots into that turret. He could put a newspaper over it. Oh. That must have been confusing, though. I mean, you see a Sherman coming at you. Yes, it's very scary. It's very scary. But what you do is you don't think. You don't think. The, the only thing you know, you, you got to get him first. So you, I, I got to get the shots in there. He's got to fire first. If he doesn't, he's going to shoot first. He's going to kill me. Was, it, was that the only tank that you killed? I think that was, that was within, that was direct fire, you know. Yeah. That's the only time I encountered direct fire. And uh, uh, Sergeant Coffey told me, that in the entire campaign, that was the only time that he encountered direct fire. After the war, did you go back to some of the sites? Yeah, I went, I went back. Of course, I went back to Bigonville. I went back to Bastogne. I went back to Singling, yeah, Trier. And any particular reason you just wanted to? No, I just wanted to see what it looked like. That's all. <laughs> what did it look like? Very different. You know, totally different. Okay. Totally different. Have you, have you seen the movie Fury? Yes. What do you think of the movie? I didn't like it. I, th I think it was a ridiculous movie. I really did. I mean, uh, how, how do you... Uh, nobody sends out a single tank all by itself, and the guy says, well, we're going to wait, and we're going to shoot it out. I mean, that just didn't happen. That's silly. Do you think it got at least the attitude of being a crewman, the, 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 the mentality of being a tanker? Yeah, so, for example, when they're supporting the infantry and they're going across the field with the infantry, was that even realistic? Well, I, had, we had one, I can get you one experience. The, the last action before was a night, was a night action. That was the evening when Lieutenant Lees went into the uh, woods and, and killed a sniper. I think I told you about. Well, we stayed in that clearing, and we went on the far side, the far side of the clearing, and the Germans pulled a night attack, which they like to do. And it, 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 the, the other side of the woods were maybe 50, no more than, than 30, 40, 50 yards at the most. And the American infantry were sitting on foxholes in these woods. So they came streaming out. 
And he told us, don't sire, because you're going to reveal your position. And a bunch of GIs came streaming out toward us across that meadow. And there was one guy I never forget. He, was, he said he was sitting in the foxhole for three days. He was caked with ice. And I swear to you, his bones were rattling. He was, that, he was not only cold, but scared. Because the Germans were you know, executing a night counterattack. And we got, he got him up into the tank, and he, right next, he was ice cold. He was shaking like a leaf, so I, I, I poured some whiskey into him. And then we got the orders to evacuate. So you ask me if we ever, if we ever got defeated, well, we never got defeated, but we got the hell out of there. It was an untenable situation. And uh, this guy sat in the foxhole, he said, for three days, three days, three nights, while the Germans were ahead of him. And you talk about an infantry guy who was glad to see the tankers. He was one of them. <laughs> ah. Can, can you give me a best memory and a worst memory of being in the tank? The worst memory? The best memory and the worst memory. Well, the best memory is ride, riding through Germany and, and going to towns with the white, white uh, sheets hanging out the window and sitting on top of the tank. And, and you know, you feel like a, a vic Yeah, you feel like a vic very powerful. You know, you know, hey, you're a conqueror. I live through this, and I'm here, and I'm sitting on top of a tank, and boy, the rest of the world is nothing. You, you're, really, you're really something, believe me. That was an unbelievable experience. If you never had that experience, you haven't lived. I want to tell you something. The worst experience was, of course, when we got hit with a bazooka, and that was I, I thought I was dead, you know. Did you, after the war, did you keep in touch with your old crewmen? Well, yeah, well, yeah, J Joe Grieb. Joe Grieb and I stayed friends for, till he died. And so did uh, my second gunner. Sir, look, the train went through and it's too loud. Okay, so, Joe Grieb. My second gunner, Pancho, Frank Lanza, he was a Puerto Rican boy. And uh, he came to visit quite often. He, was, he, he got a job as a, an official uh, escort for, for uh, uh, high-ranking uh, diplomatic visitors. He, he had a beautiful classic Spanish. He had a, he has an art history major from the University of Maryland. And uh, he was a real Latin gentleman. He was very handsome, and he's a wonderful guy. And he visited me many times in, in San Francisco, used to get together and until he finally, he got sick and he died. And Joe Grieb, my, my first gunner, we stayed in touch. And I stayed in touch with Leach all the time. Leach and I had many emails and telephone conversations. So for a long time, we, we stayed in touch most of the time. But Joe, Joe promised to come out and visit, but he didn't want to fly. So I said, well, grab a train. What the difference? Come on out. But he never married. He had a girlfriend living with him. And so I never saw him anymore for New Year's breakfast. So the, the kitchen truck did come up the night before. And we were going to camouflage it. And you tried to dig it in while the ground was so hard you couldn't, impossible. So they brought a back hole and they dug a sort of a hole, but they drove the kitchen truck in. It was right next to the Arlon Bastogne Bust Highway. It was a clump of bushes. And the bushes, were, last time I went back there, the bushes were still there. I, you know. And we put the kitchen truck in there. And they dug some foxholes for the, for the, cooks. For the cooks. 
and we all settled down New Year's Eve. There was no action, nothing. And I used my German stove. Yeah. I was going to make black out the tank. I was going to make hot coffee. I was making hot coffee, as a matter of fact. And we had some liquor. He was going to hoist a few and go to sleep. And right in the middle of this, whee, whoo, all of a sudden, every, all hell broke loose. And it, this, one of the first time that the Germans pulled an air raid. <laughs> really, very few of them. But this time they came over and they dropped a few bombs. And one of them was to hit about five, 10 yards from my tank. And it really shook, shook us up. It, it, the stove went out. And says, God damn, excuse the expression, don't, don't, you know, what the hell's going on? We were peaceful, minding our own business. Did, were you in the tank? Or huh? Inside, oh yeah, we were inside, yeah. It was just cold outside, man, it was <laughs> ice cold. I had, the sto I had the stove going, it was getting to be real nice inside. If, uh, if the Tom Sater of August of 1945, if the Tom Sater of August 1945 could go back and meet Tom Sater of 1944. What would what advice would he give him? How did you how did you be so stupid to get into that situation? It must have been some way you could have avoided it. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I would have said. 45, except you said you you lucky you lucky to 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 have made it. Very lucky. Congratulations. Did you? Uh, did you work with tank destroyers at all? Tank destroyer units? No. No? Okay. No. Not that I remember, no. Okay. And uh, my last question is, have you ever read Death Trap by Belton Cooper? No. You have not read the book? Okay. No. All right. Um, I, I imagine that was, that was about a Sherman. Uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a mechanic. He was a maintenance officer. And his opinion, because he kept seeing Shermans coming back with holes punched in them, his opinion was that the Sherman was a death trap because he kept seeing all these holes in Sherman. Look, a foxhole was not a death trap. <laughs> hey, you get into the line. Every, look, when, you, when people start shooting machine guns and artillery at you, it's a death trap. Like you said, like you said, I wouldn't have missed it for a million, but if you paid me a million, I wouldn't want to do it again. Okay. So I landed on, on Omaha Beach, but in the middle of July. No, it was a little later even. It was way after the invasion. It was nothing there anymore. But they took us over on a transport. You had to climb down the side, again, to an LCI, and they take, took you to the beach. But the war was already far away. Sergeant. Oh, I didn't make sergeant until I got into the CIC. Um, then, and then almost immediately, because then, then in, actually, our official title was special agent. I don't know what special. <laughs> I never felt special, but uh, as soon as I, as soon as I got in, within two weeks, uh, chief said to me, he said, "What do you mean?" Yeah, you, you've got to be at least a sergeant in this outfit. We don't have anybody else. So I eventually made staff. And then I signed up. And, and the uh, uh, recruiting sergeant says, well, if you sign up, you're going to be demoted back to Buck. I said, you mean to tell me I, I'm going to sign up for another three years instead of getting promoted? He said, well, that's the rule. You've got to get but you're going to get back up within a few weeks. So I finally made first three grader. And then when I signed up, my reward <laughs> was being demoted one, one grade. But it was all right, hey. As a special agent, we had tremendous privileges. Life was good. Beautiful billets. They had... We had a cook and a maid. You, there's no reveille. You don't have to fall out. Hey, regular working hours. 
except when you were on a mission or, or a, an assignment, in which case you might have worked 48 hours through, nonstop. 